Hello YouTube, I wanted to jump on here and give you guys a little bit of an insight into what COVID-19 pandemic experience looked like, felt like from a New Zealander's perspective. And I know that there's been a quite a few eyes on New Zealand in terms of it being able to eradicate the virus completely quite quickly and there's also been a lot of talk like well yeah the population's so small of course and yeah they were able to learn from Europe first before acting and that kind of thing and I would like to discuss that a little bit and unpack I think what made it so quote-unquote successful and how how quickly we were able to go from complete lockdown hugely steep growth curve in terms of cases to essentially getting rid of the virus from New Zealand and this is quite interesting because as it stands today so from as of last week we have been able to basically return to life as normal which is strange to say it's not really normal but we live life completely as we did now before COVID, obviously apart from the fallout on like business and everything like that, but I'm just saying in terms of an individual, um, able to travel around the country, no restrictions, meet my friends at bars, like just go out and live life, but without any fear that the person in front of me could have COVID. The major thing that is still in place are the travel restrictions at the border, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later and what that means for us as well. But yeah, in total, the country had a total of 1,504 cases and 22 deaths. And of those 22 deaths, um, there was a significant retirement home cluster as well, which I think really spiked those numbers. And every person more or less who passed away was either elderly or had significant underlying health conditions. Not to say that that doesn't count and these weren't important people and that kind of thing, of course, but I guess objectively from a scientific viewpoint compared to the numbers of deaths out there and the severity, especially in countries obviously like the UK, US, New Zealand did pretty damn well. And it, I think it could be just interesting for me to debrief on this experience and just let me know as you go if you have any comments down below or questions and I'll definitely come back to you and give you even more insight if there's anything I don't cover here. But before I jump in, I just wanna say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, who is Blinkist, which is an app that absolutely kept me sane during lockdown. I freaking love this app because I'm a bit of a learning animal and I like to absorb information and there's nothing quite like the feeling of reading a good book and learning a lot and getting those transformational key learnings. But I think in my my lifestyle and the way I've organized my time, I find it very, very difficult to sit down and have the time to read a book. I often find myself reading at night when I'm tired and not really taking things in. But in terms of just like for pleasure, sitting down and reading a book is just a luxury I don't often afford myself, unfortunately. But Blinkist has kind of been my solution to that and that it is an app that takes over 3,000 non-fiction titles and condenses them into what are called blinks. So these are 15 minute snippets that you can read or audio snippets that you can listen to like it's a podcast. And it gives you the key takeaways and learnings from the book, it condenses it basically. You also have access to all of these titles even offline, which is amazing. And they've just released audiobooks, which is awesome. And premium subscribers get 65% off the retail price of some of the world's best audiobooks in full length as well, if you prefer that, and that's more so your jam. So a book that became really pertinent lately is the book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to People About Race or Talking to White People About Race. And it was something that I really wanted to read, but I was like, taking the time for that seemed impossible in this particular week and being able to listen to the blink of that and get the key points and those aha moments and those learnings. Of course, that's a book that I do want to buy and read at a later date anyway, but it was able to give me the information quick. So now I'm consuming several books a week. I can cook dinner and listen to a book. I can go for a run and listen to a book. It's just a really nice feeling. It feels very productive in that I'm just taking the key insights away from these nonfiction books in a way that's like, oh, I was able to read three to five books this week. So I just love this app, such a big fan. So if you guys are keen to join me on Blinkist, then 
click the link down below. I've got a free trial for you. Sign up and give it a go, see what you think. It's a free trial to the premium membership and you can cancel at any time. So concretely guys, when you click the link in my description box, it will take you to this page, which will allow you to try it. Blinkist Premium free for seven days. And if you decide to sign up to the premium version, you'll get 25% off as well. It's a pretty sweet deal. So hope you guys enjoy that and let me know what you think and let me know which books you're reading down below. So when COVID started to become a thing, I remember looking at it quite carefully because my husband's mum was here in New Zealand. So she had come all the way from France. It was her first time traveling that long. She's in her 70s, it was a really big deal and she'd been here for six weeks and I remember starting to think like oh gosh is she going to be able to get back and I remember she literally got back the day like the Sunday night that France closed its borders so that was really good luck and she was straight into quarantine but basically her, her travel plans weren't affected um because she's in Marseille so she had to go listen to this Wellington Melbourne Melbourne Singapore, Singapore, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Marseille. So as you can imagine, there were so many opportunities for that to go haywire and not to work out. So she literally just slipped in. But I remember, it, yeah, it did take a little bit longer for New Zealand to start thinking, oh, this is a really big thing. But basically it started in February where uh, the government chartered a plane to, to evacuate Kiwis from Wuhan and China uh, back to New Zealand and they went into a quarantine. And the government started singling out China um, at this point in time, which was uh, it stopped basically travel coming in from China, closed the borders to China, and then any other travelers had to go into a self-imposed 14-day quarantine. Um, this was not regulated and we didn't really know if people were actually doing it or not. It was almost like a recommendation at this point. Then on February 28th, New Zealand gets its first case of COVID and it was from a traveler coming in from Iran which got hit really hard up front as you'll probably remember. And so it's Kiwi coming back from Iran and so the government also enforced border closures to Iran. So this was in the early stages, right? Things were starting to pick up a little bit. Not much was really being enforced apart from these two border restrictions and self-quarantine the isolation period of 14 days. It was funny because once we went from going from one case to two cases, people started going a little bit crazy. This is when you started um, seeing queues at supermarkets and people stocking up. And the, the conversations around that at the, that time were just like, these people are ridiculous. Like, calm down, it's a flu. We weren't in full on crisis mode at the, that point. And then in early March, we had case number three, so the 4th of March. So we're like, okay, we've only got three cases, but still it's another case. And it was a woman coming back from Italy. So all of our cases were people coming back from overseas. And so health professionals would go to the border and start to meet people and test people and ask them questions and that kind of stuff around COVID-19. So it started to get a little bit, I don't know, there were some, some semi-interventions coming, being put in place, but nothing really major at this point. And then basically every day we would start learning of a new case. One more case, one more case, one more case. Okay, and then on the 11th of March, the World Health Organization declared this an official pandemic. And at this point, our cases started going up sort of like two per day, four per day, eight per day, you know, throughout March, it started to grow. And this is when the government started being like, okay. So we're able to kind of see the trajectory that is happening right now in country. Italy was the big on the news a lot at this point in time. And we knew that there are a lot of New Zealanders. Um, New Zealand is a very nomadic population and that there can be up to 25% of our population living or traveling overseas at any one time. And we knew that there were gonna be a huge wave of New Zealanders coming back into the country probably. And the government started to have important conversations, let's say. They started to announce already at this point a $12 billion package worth 4% of our GDP in support of health 
in support of business, in support of consumer spending. So this is when I think people started to be like, okay, so it's declared a pandemic, we're in a crisis now, the government's starting to act, react, but there was still a lot of criticism at this point. Well, there were two camps, they were like, let New Zealanders come home, but then other people were being like, well, New Zealanders are coming home from all of these countries that already, you know, the numbers are really picking up and, and it's gonna create spread in the country. So this was the kind of debate, I guess, going on at the time in New Zealand. So at this point, this is about mid-March, it's pretty early on, the New Zealand government decides to close its borders to everyone except New Zealand citizens and permanent residents. So that was quite an extreme decision at the time where I think we had around about let's say I don't know 20-ish cases right still in quite the low numbers. Um, however you know these New Zealand citizens and residents coming in were of course bringing more and more cases with them. Um, so we're obviously under the my, I say, incredible leadership of Jacinda Ardern. Uh, she has been recognized worldwide for her handling of this. And her motto was very much, go hard, go early, and let's get this done. So I think she was very much true to that in that when we had very, very few cases, she was like, okay, we're closing the borders to anyone except New Zealanders at 20 cases. Right, this, this is quite low, but like this is quite early on in the game. But this is not to say that New Zealand did not start freaking out at some point because we started to have more and more cases per day and clusters started to emerge, right? So entire rest homes or entire schools and that would shoot the numbers up. And basically towards the end of March, the numbers kept growing and we got to the point where we were getting 50 new cases a day, 60 new cases a day. And so on the 21st of March, the government announces this four level alert system to kind of prime New Zealanders that, okay, this is what alert one looks like, which is basically where we are now, which is life is normal, but the borders are closed. Alert level two is we've got some freedoms, um, you know, social distancing measures and hand washing and all that kind of stuff must happen, but restaurants are open and, and shops are open and all that kind of thing. Uh, level three is a lot more restrictive, um, where basically the basic shops are open and you should limit travel between regions, you should limit seeing people who aren't in your immediate family and that kind of thing. And then level four is like the extreme lockdown, like you're not allowed to see anyone outside of your bubble, you're only allowed to move if it's to exercise and get out and to go to the supermarket basically, or for healthcare reasons, for very, very, very essential services. And at this point we were at alert level two. And for the first time, so all of our cases at this point had been identified as cases that had come in from overseas. There wasn't any community transmission at this point until there started to be one, two cases where there were no links to overseas travelers. And this is where our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced, okay, let's go, it's on. We're going up to alert level three. So what this meant is that people were instructed to stay home, um, schools were closing, moving to online schooling, all businesses were closing, travel was severely limited, all of that jazz. And she also announced that by the way, in 48 hours from now, we're going hard, we're in alert level four. So we're going to go quite extreme, quite early, um, at around about the 150 case mark, 200 case mark. So this is when we had 200, around, let's say 200 cases of COVID. Now at the time, our growth curve was like this. This is when we started to get 50, 60, then 70, 80 cases a day and it was sort of, it wasn't necessarily doubling every single day, but it was it was growing quite dramatically. And when the Prime Minister announced this, uh, there were also predictions of thousands and thousands of cases that were going to happen in New Zealand. So it's like, if, if we go hard and go early, we might be able to limit this. There were, there were talks about 10,000 cases um, in total. So Yes, we went early, but the growth curve and, and the trajectory was like anywhere and we were on track definitely to have thousands of cases in our population. And so obviously the rest is history, um, the virus has been completely eradicated from New Zealand, there are zero active cases, and on June 8th we moved down to alert level 1 and we're living life as normal now apart from the, the borders being closed. So I guess, how did we experience that severe lockdown period in New Zealand? So there was the concept of the bubble. The bubble were the people in your household and you had to stay within your bubble. What was quite nice is that um, because we've got 
tracks walking tracks and we can go biking and stuff near our home um it's literally just there um the hills and everything we're able to we were able to live a relatively normal life and that you know i work from home anyway niels came and worked from home and set up in the office here and we were still able to do sport and go out and we, we never had to show forms we never had to do things separately like i know in france it was you know one person from the family um, could go out and that kind of thing so uh, we were able to still do things as a couple go for walks go for runs go for bike rides which was huge for mental health also I mean we're in a house here with an outdoor area we're not in a small Parisian apartment anymore so that was huge as well so quite frankly our personal experience of lockdown was relatively easy aside from missing friends and family um, and also the anxiety of oh my gosh when are we going to be able to get to France is that going to happen this year uh, aside from that our experience of lockdown was was pretty positive and I would say what worked well generally in New Zealand is that they really respected the concept of the bubble in general I would say that uh, for some reason we tend to be a really disciplined nation um, in that, you know, when you can see the collective effort, when you're doing it as a team, I don't know if it's because we have a sports culture, I don't know what it is, but I feel like there was this mentality of like, don't let the team down. And Jacinda would use the, the language, our team of five million. And yeah, maybe it comes from the sports culture, but we would call people out. If, if we saw people breaking the rules, there was like a hotline, people would call it, like we would call people out because we didn't want to let the team down and so in general people did stay home people were really disciplined and people followed the rules something that was quite sweet which i'm not sure if they did in any other country but we had this teddy bear hunt concept where we would put stuffed animals and teddy bears in the window so that if you went for a walk outside around the block especially with kids you would be able to see the teddy bears and stuffed animals in the windows and it was kind of like a treasure hunt in that way which was really sweet and something that i know that jacinda ardern got kind of criticized for like oh you're not an elementary school teacher is that in one of her press conferences, so herself and the director of health, Ashley Bloomfield, would show up every single day and give updates every single day. So we knew what was going on and everything. And in one of them, she announced that the Easter Bunny was an essential service worker. And yeah, so like a lot of people were like, oh, but also a lot of people were like, oh, for God's sake, you know, you're, you're the leader of a country. But I think her leadership is fantastic for this exact reason, is that she's like a boss female leader who is able to have a baby and lead with empathy and really lean into that and that's her strong suit actually is that she's human and authentic and you don't get that in a lot of world leaders so just saying um so i think it i mean i i personally think she's incredible and awesome for that softer side as well and when she was questioned about the teddy bears like don't you think that teddy bears are going to entice people to get out of the home more regularly than they should this question that she got from a journalist she was like well if you come down to my place in wellington i've got one in my window like yeah so in terms of support for workers there were government packages for people who were not able to work or had a significant drop of in income so for example um for me as i'm self-employed if i had seen an an, an income drop of 30 percent or higher over um, previous comparable months. I was uh, entitled to a 7,000 New Zealand dollar grant, which enabled me to basically, you know, tie the bills over and everything for a few months. In terms of my work though, um, surprisingly demand didn't really, de I mean, it did for a few months because people were like, oh, maybe it's not the right time to change careers. and and look for a new job and that kind of thing but i still had some clients coming in wanting to find the clarity and and realizing that they didn't actually like what they were doing and they wanted to work with me to figure out uh what was next for them right because like when you strip away the office and the colleagues and that kind of thing and you're just working from home on your actual job like the tasks you do the projects you run and you realize i hate my actual job um yeah some people were like i'm gonna use lockdown to kind of work on that and stuff so i did have a drop but i didn't have um such a significant drop that it made me worried and we were really lucky for niels he's just able to 
work from home who works for one of New Zealand's electricity providers. So it's very local and it's very essential and there were there was never any question about uh, whether or not he would lose his job. So very, very lucky in that respect. And the government provided employers with these bailout packages essentially so that they were able to keep paying the, the wages of their staff and all sorts of support and, and financial sort of backing as well from the government, which was great. Of course, they couldn't save everyone. So one of New Zealand's biggest markets and industries is of course the tourism industry and it's been annihilated of course we can do our best to encourage local tourism and all that kind of thing but it's just not the same there's literally millions of visitors to New Zealand each and every year and jobs are absolutely lost across tourism and hospitality I'm sure it's the same in your countries as well wherever you're watching and there has been some criticism around that like we went so hard it was a bit over the top like we've we've destroyed businesses and lives and families and livelihoods and that's obviously the um, argument coming in from the, the party on the right and you know I'm more of the belief that um, lives are more important than income and business for a short period of time we saved potentially hundreds of deaths and thousands tens of thousands of cases for going hard and going early so i respect the health first decisions that were made but of course the situation for everyone this crisis this pandemic it has shattered many dreams and many livelihoods for us i guess the question is when will we be back in France next? That is the question that we're asking ourselves. We're just desperately looking for at the news and, and Macron's announcements because he's announced on June 15 that he's opening the borders to certain European countries. And we're like, okay, so when will international tra travel be allowed? And hopefully New Zealand will be one of the first countries on the list because we did do so well with the pandemic um, and literally case free. So hopefully that will be okay. Um, but you know in terms of airline operators and also the transits right that's a problem as well transiting through the countries which you have to do there's no such thing as a direct flight from New Zealand to France so so yeah that was um, that's a huge thing that's playing on our mind at the moment as well so yeah overall I would say I'm incredibly proud of New Zealand's leadership I look at some of the other leaders in the countries where things aren't working well and I find it quite telling. Um, I am incredibly proud of New Zealand's like teamwork and mentality to not let the community down and just follow the rules and get it done and go hard and go early and just get it over and done with. That worked really, really well. We did act early. We were able to see the signals and the numbers really picking up in Europe, in particular Italy. Um, but still, relatively, I think things started moving and action started being taken very, very early on in the game. And that those decisions didn't have to be made and there were definitely other political parties lobbying for those decisions not being made in the interest of money and the economy and tourism and all of those kinds of things so it was definitely a big decision to be made and I think the right decision was made ultimately and yeah now we'll see how New Zealand will survive in the next few years just like the rest of the world we're obviously probably going into um some form of crisis and uh, record levels of unemployment and yeah tourism and hospitality and other industries being shattered and there's going to be a lot of recovery to do but I do think that because we got through the health part so quickly and there wasn't that huge strain on our hospitals and medical uh, facilities that we will start opening things up and going back to normal quote unquote normal uh, faster than the average we're already talking about opening a bubble with Australia so a trans like Tasman bubble between New Zealand and Australia for that tourism industry to start being stimulated again um, I think we are in a position where we are going to be able to weather this quite well and get out of it sooner get out of any potential crisis sooner than other countries so yeah that was that was a little insight into lockdown in New Zealand but if you have any questions about my personal experience about the country's approach or attitude or anything like that please do let me know down below really happy to look into that and to answer those for you and otherwise I hope that your experience of this is going as well as it possibly can when it, wherever you are and that you're starting to see some glimmers of hope and some life going back to normal to some extent speaking from um, a country that's a little bit more advanced in the future and we're there already and 
it feels good and it's and it's peace of mind when you know that the numbers are so low or completely zero and you're able to kind of go back to living life and seeing friends and family and traveling within your country and all that good stuff. I really hope that we're all there as soon as possible and we look back on this and be like, okay, that was crazy. What did we learn? We're out of it now. The worst is over. And of course we can't wait to be back in France, just crossing our fingers that we can come back in maybe August or September. Please wish us luck, cross your fingers for us. And yeah, otherwise I'll let you guys get on with your days. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. A bientôt.